It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is the one and only Ken Ham, and we're going to be discussing his new book, Will They Stand? Parenting Kids to Face the Giants. Ken, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be with you, and I'm just not sure how to pronounce your name, because with an Australian accent, I would say Sean. <laughs> that works. I, I would respond to that. Half the time, people think I say John when it's Sean, so oh, okay. you, you said it more right than half the people who try to say <laughs> my name, so, so thank you for that. Uh, now, in terms of the, the circles I roll in, I am a homeschooling father of 10, very familiar with the work of Answers in Genesis and many of Ken's books, so to me, Ken needs no introduction, but I know inevitably somebody's going to watch this or listen to this who hasn't yet encountered you or the ministry of answers in Genesis. So if you had to give us kind of the elevator pitch, elevator pitch version of who is Ken Ham and what's your ministry about, uh, share that with us now just for their benefit. Well, answers in Genesis is an apologetics ministry, which, which doesn't mean we apologize for our faith. It means uh, we give people uh, reasons for what they believe. In other words, we equip people to defend the Christian faith against the secular attacks of our age. Actually, if you said sum up what you do at Answers in Genesis, we have the two attractions, two leading Christian themed attractions in the world, the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter. Basically, you know, when the secular media say in one line, tell us what you're doing here. Well, the history in the Bible is true. That's why the gospel based on that history is true. We're evangelistic, but there's been an incredible attack on God's word in this era, particularly on the book of Genesis and many Christians have succumbed to that, and yet Genesis is foundational to all our doctrine, it's foundational to the rest of the Bible, it's foundation to our whole worldview, and so our ministry really is a biblical authority ministry. We see the authority of the Word of God has come under attack by those attacks on Genesis in this era, and so we are equipping people to be able to stand on God's Word, defend the Christian faith, and help raise up generations of godly offspring and i can tell that you believe in genesis sean because with 10 10 children you said uh yes. you know in genesis it reads be fruitful and multiply so i guess you've done that <laughs> yes my wife and i definitely uh took that to heart uh the funniest comment i ever had about having so many children i visited with dr joel Beeky a number of years back and he said brother you're working on a second quiver uh with that many kids so oh yes. yeah well we we have five <laughs> kids but now we have 18 grandkids so I always told people when we had five kids, that uh, a quiver was five, because it says, blessed is a man whose quiver is full, and ours was full at five, so therefore it was five, right? <laughs> uh, well, we're not quite to that grandparenting stage yet, but it will be here uh, before we know it. And, and I would say for somebody listening or watching this who hasn't yet been to the Ark Encounter or the Creation Museum, it is a fantastic experience. I can't recommend that highly enough. I've got lots of different friends that work there at the ministry, and you will definitely enjoy the experience. And I have to say, in terms of my own reading journey, I never used to think uh, what I encountered in the book of Genesis was all that important and still I, until I started listening to some of Ken's messages and reading some of his books. And, and then I came to understand what, what we read in Genesis and what we do with it actually has a lot of implication for what we do with the whole rest of the Bible. And so uh, that's something that I, I don't think uh, any of us can really grasp deeply enough. The whole Bible is important including the book of Genesis. So, so don't throw that baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, I sort, of, uh, I sort of look on it, Sean, as Genesis 1 to 11 is like the foundation to a house, and the rest of it's like the walls and the roof. You know, And if you don't have the foundation, then the walls and the roof won't stand. Yeah, nobody wants to live in a house like that. So make sure you understand and stand on that firm foundation. Uh, you know, Ken, if somebody said, hey, Sean, Ken Ham has a brand new book coming out. I would often assume it's going to be about creation. It's going to be, as you've said, something related to apologetics. Um, in terms of your new book, Will They Stand? How does this maybe differ um, from some of the other books we've seen from you through the years? Yeah, in fact, it's interesting. Some of the staff who have read it and others have said they believe it's the best one I've, I've ever done uh, because we open ourselves up personally. You know, it's more of a personal book with more of a personal testimony. And it's, it's a practical application book, too, in regard to, you know, the family is the first and most fundamental of all human institutions, which God ordained in Scripture. And, of course, he created the family when he made the first man and woman and then said, be fruitful and multiply. And, you know, in Malachi 2, uh, where, you know, the, the Israelites were divorcing wives and bearing pagans and the prophet asked the question, you know, why did God make them one? Two, one reference back to Genesis, you know, that woman was made from man, why marriage? And the answer is seeking godly offspring. And so 
for my wife and I, I mean, we have five children, but you know, when our first child was born, we're thinking in terms of, you know, how are we going to to train them? So, what does God's word say? Uh, are, are the principles there? And so, this particular book deals with that aspect of things. In other words, the principles from God's word in regard to training children. You know, what does it mean to be the salt of the earth? How do we help our kids to be salt like they should be, and so on? But it starts much further back than that. It, it starts with my, my own parents and how they trained us and how they equipped us as children to defend the Christian faith and never knowingly compromise God's word. And then that journey uh, going through high school and then through university and then a public high school teacher and how that led to the Answers in Genesis ministry starting in our home in Australia in 1977, actually. And uh, that dates me a little bit, doesn't it? My first, my first uh, teaching appointment was in 1975, a little country town west of Brisbane in Australia. And how, you know, those students even saying to me, sir, you're a Christian, but how can you be a Christian? We know the Bible's not true. Why not? Because of what was in their textbooks about evolution. And so it's really a journey on uh, that really relates my own personal testimony and how even at 10 years old, a missionary that my parents had brought into the area challenged us to to commit our lives to the Lord and go where God wants us to go and do what God wants us to do. And I remember making that commitment back there at 10 and how the Lord used that to bring me into this ministry and the burden for the Creation Museum that goes back to the uh, late 70s. And then because of you know the, the kids I was teaching in school, taking them to museums that were all from an atheistic perspective. And then uh, how all of that led to the formation of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, a ministry that is impacting millions, millions of people around the world. And so it's a book about legacy. It's a book about spiritual legacy and challenging people. What legacy are you leaving in your children? What legacy are you leaving on this earth? The most important legacy is a spiritual one. And really this ministry of Answers in Genesis, Creation Museum and Ark Encounter that is impacting tens of millions of people a year is a legacy of parents who, you know, they don't have any statues anywhere. They didn't have any books that they published, uh, but uh, parents in Australia who faithfully raised up a generation to stand on God's word. And so that's what it's all about. And that, there's a couple of unique aspects to it in that too, in that, for instance, I talk about um, the birth of our children. We got funny stories about the birth of all of our children. Just, you know, for instance, our eldest daughter, she has a, a chapter at the back of the book and she started a, a Christian school under Answers in Genesis. Now, some of our kids homeschool, some Christian school, some do both. And she had a real burden because a lot of Christian schools and no better than secular schools, they just sort of add God to secular philosophy. And she started a Christian school called 12 Stones Christian Academy as a discipleship school and to help parents in raising up uh, kids with a truly Christian worldview. So she has a chapter at the end there. And, and when you read that, you'll, you'll get an example of that spiritual legacy being passed on uh, to that generation and to our kids and how she's passing it on to the next generation. And then there's a chapter there about my wife, who is not a public speaker. She doesn't want. And, and uh, so I had one of our writers actually interview her, because if it wasn't for uh, my wife being 100 percent supportive, 100 percent, I should say a million percent supportive of me in this ministry. She has never questioned it, uh, never questioned it, me being away and doing the things that I've done over the years to our kids. And our kids have always seen her totally devoted to the family, to them. And, you know, something my mother taught me and something my wife's parents taught her, you know, God first, others second, yourself last. And she is so selfless and so generous. And anyway, I, I put a chapter there devoted to her. So it's got a lot of personal aspects to it, as well as the biblical principles on, on raising children. So it's a very unique sort of book in that way. Well, and uh, one comment I want to make in, in terms of having followed Ken for so many years is the one thing I've already always appreciated is he's been very consistent with what he's about, what God has him on mis mission for, what his message is. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of authors and leaders through the years ebb and flow with whatever is popular uh, throughout culture. But one thing I've come to uh, trust is regardless of what I read or listen to or watch from Ken, 
He's going to be consistent and on mission. And I've just really personally appreciated that through the years. Um, I was going to ask this at the end of the interview, but since you kind of talked about uh, your wife, uh, you know, I, lots of my friends who watch and listen to this show, many of them are pastors, itinerant speakers who travel the world, um, would love to just get a little bit of insight. You, you as somebody who's uh, traveled and spoken all over the world throughout your career in ministry, um, how do you how do you balance that uh, well as, as parents and, and partnering and uh, leading well? Because um, that that's a unique challenge that I feel uh, people in ministry have to navigate, and not everybody has good answers uh, for them for how they can do that well. No, in, and you know what? There's, it's a very important question. And when I look at our children now, I know you know for any of us, there's no guarantee that whatever you do, therefore they're going to be Christians or whatever. But the scripture does give us. Um, very, very uh, strong teaching in regard to how to how to raise up your children. But I look, you know, all our five kids, they love the Lord, they're devoted to the Lord, they're involved with our ministry in one degree or another. And our grandkids, they love the Ark, they love the Creation Museum. They just think it's normal to have an Ark and Creation Museum, you know. They sort of grew up with it. They don't know all the battles we had over the years and what it was like before we had such. And, you know, we never heard of such a thing when I was a teacher or anything like that. And they just grow up with it. It's just automatic for them. So, uh, but... You know, you know, a lot of this really comes down to, I, I think, a number of things. But I think, number one, I, I have observed over the years, because I was very concerned about that. And I've seen a lot of pastors, uh, Christian leaders, where, you know, the kids drift away from the Lord uh, or rebel or, you know, there's, there's issues in their marriage or something like that. And one of the things that I have seen is that, Sometimes, you know, if, if you're not one together as, as husband and wife in that ministry and totally supportive of each other, that can have a detrimental effect on, on the kids and on your ministry. And I've seen, for instance, um, wives who have, have not supported their husband are totally in that. And in a sense, some of them have been, you know, jealous of them traveling and doing those things or, or question what they're doing in front of the kids. I, I've seen uh, those husbands who don't seem to care about their wives in the way that they should. You know, a lot of those things can contribute to this. I, I, but my wife has always been 100% committed to this ministry. She sees it as, you know, we're one together. We, you become one when you're married um, because we're one place, you know, Genesis 2.24. And she's always said that her and I are one in this ministry and that part of her job was to support me in this ministry and what God has called me to so that I could do the speaking and be away when I needed to. And yet she always told the kids, you know, daddy is uh, the spiritual head of the house. And she would always show that in front of them when I was uh, there with them and uh, even call me for advice when I was away um, and make sure that when I was home that I showed that spiritual leadership as I should. In other words, that she hadn't just taken the place of that and taken over that. Um, and the, a, another aspect of it too, in this ministry, you know, the Lord has specially blessed us and our kids, I believe, because they have had famous theologians stay in our house, you know, like Dr. John Wickham, uh, they were able to mix with Dr. Dwayne Gish, and he stayed in our house from the Institute for Creation Research, you know, the great creation debater when you go back to the uh, uh, 70s and, and 80s. Uh, that we, we, they've had an impact of many famous scientists who have stayed with us or they've got to meet over the years or even meet people like, you know, Dr. Raymond Damadian, who actually was the one who invented the MRI, and he's a, a great creationist and Christian and and growing up in this ministry uh, and seeing their dad and mum stand on the authority of God's word and meeting all those people and seeing the the the, the steps of faith we took and yet God uh, and blessing those and uh, the, the way in which the creation museum came about and then the ark encounter that that all had a great impact on their life and each of our kids, it's interesting, our five kids, four that are married, one that's single, and by the way, she's a good cook and has, has a good car and nice little house, and I'm, I just like to advertise if I'm allowed to advertise, you know, I'm starting to get desperate right now, but <laughs> anyway, but she's, no, she's a wonderful single young girl, works at the ministry here, but 
our, our kids are all passionate for the word of God because they've seen both their mum and their dad, both passionate for the word of God and grown up with apologetics, grown up with all these answers to skeptical questions and grown up being taught to have a truly Christian worldview and seeing the impact of the ministry on people's lives and meeting all these people that also stand on God's word. That's had a phenomenal impact on them. But a lot of it really goes back to if you read that chapter in the book that uh, that, that, that features my wife, it, it's you'll read there how she says she wanted to support me, you know, a million percent, and that she sees the ministry as much she's called to it as me. We're called to it together, different roles in the ministry, but called to it together. It's had a big impact, and I I think when kids growing up seeing their parents. We, we've never had, we've never had a, any any struggles, uh, you know, in relationships or anything. Totally devoted to each other. The kids have seen that. They've never felt any any uneasiness because there's been any relationship issues. Made that commitment before the Lord. We love each other. Love each other more than we've ever loved each other. And uh, to see their parents like that, and to see a mother never questioning. Uh, the ministry, but being one with it, I think that has had one of the greatest impacts on them. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, that is very insightful. And I, I feel uh, really just an encouragement and a good example for those of us who uh, are coming up, raising our own children and something that we can uh, have many takeaways as we try to figure out how to be on journey ourselves as couples, as families and ministering and partnering together. Uh, with what God is calling us to do as well. I, I love the partnership aspect that came out in what you just shared. Uh, in terms of where we are culturally, you know, n- not everybody grows up in church. You know, that's one of the things uh, I always treasure is I had the benefit of growing up in church. I had the benefit of gro- growing up in Bible college or going to Bible college. Uh, but, you know, as I meet new people who are coming into th- uh, the church or, uh, you know, discovering their Christian faith for the first time, Uh, a lot of times they don't even know who Adam is or who Jesus is. Like they just have zero context. Um, And so in terms of, you know, I think of a a parent who's picking up this book because they're looking for wisdom and insight, but this idea of biblical parenting, completely foreign, wasn't modeled for them when they're growing up. And I feel like a lot of times when, when we're changing, uh, you know, making a big generational shift and step, you know, pressing in hard for what God's calling us to do with our family um, there's resistance inside because, you know, like, well, I, I didn't have that when I grew up or I made bad decisions when I was coming up. How can I try to lead my family in a new direction, almost feeling like they're a hypocrite? And so I feel like that can be a stumbling block for people. So uh, in terms of people who are just new to this whole concept of biblical parenting, what would be your encouragement to, to be strong and keep moving in the direction? You know, it, it's, it's interesting. We grew up in an interesting culture. We're growing up in a different world uh to to what we experienced in the past you know my wife often says to me she says you know i really feel for our grandkids she said they're growing up in a different world it's a different culture and we need to do all we can to prepare them uh for that culture and uh, how do we do that the thing we thing that has, has always hit me and i mean my parents drummed this into me over and over again you know man's word changes but god's word never changes and then you judge everything you believe against God's word. You know, for instance, this even pertains to this, in my opinion, in regard to study Bibles, right? Take the Schofield Study Bible, and in the notes, it's got the gap theory. And a lot of these people have believed the gap theory because Schofield said it. You know, my father always taught me the notes are not inspired like the text. And just remember, the text is the commentary on the notes. <laughs> in other words, always make sure you realize God's word is the absolute authority. You know, with some of the younger generations like X, uh, Generation X, well, particularly Generation Y, Millennials, Generation Z, and then Alpha, you know, the younger ones, you know, and you talk to them, a lot of it's, you know, it's what they feel, but I feel this, but I feel that. Well, we've got to remember that, you know, we are sinful creatures. You can't trust your feelings. The heart of man is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. You've got to judge what you feel against the absolute authority of God's word. So what I'm really saying is this, you know, for anyone, it doesn't matter who we are, what influences there's been in your life, what books you've read, who has said what about what you should do as a parent. Here's what, here's what I would do. Here's a test. Get a piece of paper and a pen. Write down, what does God's word say about parenting? What does he say are the roles for mother, 
the roles for father, husband, wife. What are your roles according to the Bible? What's the priority for education? Uh, what principles does God give you to be able to train your children? What, what does God say? Not what somebody else says. Because, see, that's really what my parents taught us to do. It, it, God's word, he's the absolute authority. That's why my father would never knowingly compromise God's word. You know, it, you, you talk about the consistency of, of the message. Well, when you stand on God's word, you know, you, one, one of the things you see today is some of the church suffering their attitudes towards LGBT, you know, towards the gay marriage issue and so on. But you see, God's word hasn't changed. We should be standing on God's word. We judge what the culture is believing against God's word. And so one of the things I even did in this book was to sort of summarize in a way the principles that my wife and I uh, have learned uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the scriptures in regard to how to train children, uh, how to raise children. You know, for a start, there's a big emphasis in the world today on equality, but does the Bible really teach equality in the sense of man and woman? I mean, we're created differently. Man was made from dust. Woman was made from his side. Uh, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. He made a help meet for him. Scripture says where to submit to each other, but it also says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It says wives um, be submissive to your husbands in, in the Lord. In other words, God has made us differently and given us different roles. And what we've got to be saying to ourselves is this, what are the roles God has given to us? You, you know, in Genesis uh, chapter three, as a, result of, as a result of the judgment of the curse, one of the things that we read there is how God says, in pain, you shall bring forth children. Now we know that means physical pain and also emotional pain. But then it says, your desire shall be to your husband and he shall rule over you. And a lot of the commentators that I have looked at it, it it would would say this it's like where you read about uh, Cain and Abel and about uh, sin desires you Cain it's crouching at the door it wants to overtake you and he let it do that and he killed his brother Abel well because of sin this is going to affect us and distort the roles that God has given to us and so for a woman um, your desire shall be to your husband there will be many who will want to take over the role of their husband. We see that in the feminist movement, for instance, and not want them to be the spiritual head they shall be. And uh, then it talks about the man, you shall rule over you. In other words, because of sin, men are going to lord it despotically over a woman. That's going to be the propensity. And we see that in many places in the world today too. So what we've got to do is say, okay, what does God say is my role? Uh, my my role as a father, mother, uh, father, husband, mother, wife, and then I've got to look at what God warns me about what sin is going to do, and I've got to do my best to overcome that. And then, what are the principles to use in training our children? For instance, what one of the big issues to me when we had our firstborn, we'd never heard of homeschooling, no such thing in Australia. I didn't even know what that was. And there was a little Christian school at start. I think it was the first one in the state of Queensland. And we wanted our son to go there because we wanted them to be grounded in God's word and have a true Christian worldview. And one of the things that happened was that people in the church actually complained about it and said, your kids should be in the public schools to witness to the other kids. Well, we're where people send their children, what they do is between them and the Lord, I can't say to you, you should do this, you should do that. And I know there are single parent families. There are all sorts of issues. It's a fallen world. But we should be trying to do our best to use good biblical arguments and to the best of our ability, to the utmost, try, trying to apply those biblical principles. And when I would ask them, why should our kids be in the public school? And they would say, well, they're to witness to the other kids what's your Bible justification? What's God's word justification for that? You ought to be the salt of the earth. I say, well, wait a minute. If you read in scripture, it says we are to be salt, but you can't be salt till you have it. How can my kids be salt if they don't have it? And then there's a warning, you know, in Matthew 5 and Mark 9, there's warnings. If the salt's contaminated, it's good for nothing. And so isn't, uh, isn't 
the Bible telling me that I am to do my best to put in as uncontaminated salt as possible so that when they become mature and filled with salt and biblical truth and apologetics, being able to defend their faith, they can then be effective witnesses in the world. Um, but I can't just throw them to the world or, you know, I don't send them to the Philistines to be trained, uh, you know, as a, uh, the Israelites, you know, wouldn't have sent their kids to the Philistines to be trained. In other words, instead of just, oh, well, that's what you do. You heard that from somewhere. What does the Bible actually say? You know, uh, if you look at what Paul says about Timothy, that from a child, you have known the scriptures. And so for my wife and I, for instance, you know, when our children were born, one of the things we started to do was show them certain books with pictures in like back then there was a, there was a creationist dinosaur book by Dwayne Gish called Dinosaurs as Terrible Lizards so we would open up the pages and show the kids the pictures you know as they were little babies people thought we we're nuts but as as they got older they would point at the pictures and then we would be telling them what it says and then we'd start to read it and then eventually they could actually read it and they became their favorite books. So right from a young age, we were teaching them apologetics and, and showing them uh, the things of the Lord and teaching them biblical truths to put that salt in them so that they can be the salt of the earth. And, you know, it's hard work. And, uh, you know, the, the, the world wants to drag them in the other direction. Uh, we recognize that they're all sinful creatures. And so that salt pours out the bottom. Sometimes it seems faster than you're pouring it in the top. Uh, but you've got to work hard. And when you look at the investment that we put into that, my wife and I both put into that, and we look at our kids today and see they've married godly spouses, and now they're raising up their children this way, and you see that spiritual legacy passed on because that's what should be happening. You don't want to lose it in one generation, you know, like the Israelites crossing the Jordan River, and then those that were with Joshua dies, and Joshua dies, and then the next generation served Baal. The fathers didn't teach their children like they should have. And so it really comes down to just put everything aside and say, what does God's word clearly teach? Well, I, I like the what you just shared in terms of uh, it starts when they're young, you know, reading to them when they're little. Uh, I would venture to say, even as we're pray, praying over those future children, even before they're conceived before they're and as they're in the yeah. womb, it is a, a lifelong process. And as a, a father with kids, my oldest kids are now getting into their early 20s. Uh, it's not like the parenting has stopped or the teaching or the coaching and the training. It's obviously going to be a, a lifelong journey, but that's the privilege uh, of being a parent and really stewarding well these children that God gives us to steward and care for. Uh, in terms of uh, people pushing back uh, when we walk, try to walk and lead and move in the direction of just kind of standing on biblical authority, I feel like if if we came up in a family culture where standing on biblical authority wasn't a thing. We didn't come from a Christian home. You know, if we lead our family in a new direction, I know we, we will get pushed back from family and friends who just, they're disagreeing or they're uncomfortable with the direction we're going. Clearly, uh, culture is pushing back big time on biblical authority in ways that we never thought, I think, even possible uh, a few years ago. Obviously, navigating people pushing back on biblical authority, something you are not a stranger to. Um, how do How do we navigate that, like, tactfully with grace, but also standing strong in what we know to be the truth. I feel like that's something that people are really struggling with right now in the sense that we're in a season where if you if you are like the nail who sticks its head up and try to stand for something, you're probably going to have a hammer come down on you. Um, but we're in a place where, you know, actually standing for what we believe or what we say we believe, it may cost us something. You know, let me say a couple of things there, Sean. Uh, number one, one of the things that's always at the foremost of our minds as, as parents is that every child conceived in his mother's womb, and we're thinking of our five children and then our 18 grandchildren, uh, and of course the, the spouses of our four children that are married, but every child conceived in a mother's womb is a being who's going to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, forever and ever in heaven or hell. And Children are an heritage of the Lord. They're a gift to us to train from the Lord. And when you think, Paul reminds us, the things of this world are nothing compared to eternity. You know, I often think about, you know, this, this world. I mean, you might, if, if you live for 90 years, that's considered old. Uh, I mean, Prince Philip just died at 99 years old. Uh, but what's that compared to eternity? It's nothing. And so 
we look at it and say, you know what? It, we, we have got to make sure we understand that spiritual legacy passed on our children is so important. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. It doesn't matter. We, we have to answer to the Lord for that. And we're talking about their eternity, their spiritual legacy, you know. So we, we look at that. It's, I hear my mother. I can hear my mother right now in my head. You know what she drummed into us over and over and over and over and over. I'll never forget it. You know, and she says, it's only what's done for Jesus at last. Remember that. It's only what's done for Jesus at last. And uh, even, you know, she was dying in hospital and uh, we're over there. She almost 92 years old. And she said, you know, she said, all the material things of this world, they really mean nothing. And she said, it only seems like yesterday I was a little girl and then got married. And look, here I am now. And, and she says, it's only what's done for Jesus at last. And so there's that aspect. And then another thing I would say is, you know, I think that a lot of people haven't been taught the right way to talk to these people um, that that would oppose us. And, you know, you're going to stand out today. If you stand on biblical authority, you're going to stand out. Even in the church, you're going to stand out. Um, and, for instance, just give a practical example. You know, I've had uh, some of these LGBT people tell me, but, um, but you people who say marriage is a man and a woman, you know, that's hate speech because, you know, we, we, you're telling us we're wrong. You know, that's hate speech. Well, they, they've said to me, but you've got to tolerate, why don't you tolerate all views? You're, you're intolerant people, you Christians. And uh, so the, the thing we've got to understand is there's that clash of worldviews up here. But actually, the, actually um, the real battle is down here. Does, does your worldview come from God's word or man's word? See, the battle is, is not up here, really, ultimately. That's why, as I explain to people, gay marriage, abortion, gender issues, uh, all these, racism, people think they're different problems. No, they're symptoms, different symptoms of the same problem. The problem is if you don't build your thinking on God's word, but build it on man's word. And so that's why, as I say to people, it's the way you talk to people is very important. So when someone says to me, you know, what do you believe about all? Like a practical example, a man come up to me and he said, I'm a homosexual, I believe in gay marriage. So what do you say to that? And I say, well, can I explain to you, first of all, because I'm a Christian and I start with the Bible, that's where my worldview comes from. And he says, well, I don't believe the Bible. Don't give me that religious stuff. Well, see, there's a problem because even a lot of Christians think there's a, a non-religious position, but there's not. Everyone has a religion. Everyone has beliefs. People think that, oh, if you're not a Christian, you're neutral. That's not true. Uh, there's no neutrality. You're either for Christ or against light, darkness, rock, sand. There's no neutrality. And so what I do in some of my talks is to, to help people understand when you're talking to these people that disagree with you, to help them understand the clash up here is because I have a different starting point. And so I say to this person, you don't believe the Bible, but I do. So can you tell me why you don't believe the Bible? I actually bait them because the real argument is, why do you have the wrong foundation? You know, why don't you have the foundation of God's word? Do you think it's, do you think science has disproved that? Do you think we live in a scientific age? I'll bait them deliberately because I know they'll say some of those things. Then I start to answer their questions. And then after I've answered a lot of their questions, I'll say, now, look, regardless of anything else, I do start here. That's why I have this worldview. And I understand if you start at a different place, you don't have the same starting point of the Bible or believe Genesis the same way I do. You can have a different worldview. And until we sort out uh, the, the foundational battle down here, we're never going to agree up here because it's, it starts down here. And that helps them understand this is not hate speech i want you to understand the reason i have this worldview is because i have a different foundation but acknowledge they have a different worldview acknowledge i understand why you have the worldview do your worldview is consistent with your foundation i just believe you have the wrong foundation so let's let's talk about that and you know when and then when they say to me but you're intolerant i say but you are what do you mean well, you don't tolerate all views. Yeah, we do. We allow all views of marriage. You won't allow all views. What about the view that they're all wrong and there's only one view based on the Bible and that's one man and one woman? Oh, well, you're being intolerant. Wait a minute, aren't you being intolerant of my view? There's that clash. And the reason for the clash is because we have a different foundation. So we've got to learn how to argue foundationally is what I call it. Be equipped with apologetics. I learn how to argue foundationally, understanding no one is neutral, 
and understanding no one is non-religious, all have a religious position. And unfortunately, much of the church has not taught that. And so they think when they threw God, the Bible out of public schools, now they're neutral. No, um, if their foundation is not God's word, it's man's word. They're, they're extremely atheistic. The, the religion of the public schools is atheism. They're really temples of public school and the high priest is Darwin and a lot of the teachers are the priests. I mean, you've got to start understanding reality when it comes to how to think. Very helpful perspective. Um, I, I can't even count how many times just in conversations with different leaders behind the scenes in the past year, really looking at the different worldviews people are approaching things with and that uh, how often people don't realize that when they're examining what they see in the news or on social media or what they're reading. And, you know, they, they do want to think, well, th that's neutral and this is neutral and there's no values. Yet everything is driven by a worldview and there's values that are being placed on any piece of content somebody creates. Uh, we just really need to uh, realize that. And I think some of that is a, a loss in uh, the ability to do critical thinking. I think of mm -hmm. some of the benefits I had in Bible college and some of the grad school classes I did. I was required to go and pick apart articles, look at where did this person go to school? What have they written before they wrote this? And really try to grasp the worldview of the person who was trying to message me through this article um, before I could respond to it. And that was a skill set that I am a, I'm super appreciative of. And that's the same skill set we need to keep applying as we're trying to figure out what people are saying in culture and how do we respond to it. We have to be very aware uh, that there's always a worldview at play. Uh, Ken, in terms of the, the reader's journey with the book, somebody spends the time, they get to that last page, close that back flap. What's, what's that big idea the big impact you hope every single reader takes away from the pages of this new book well um to me you close the the book up that's the book and you say what legacy am i leaving on this earth first of all just generally what legacy am i leaving and i'm married and have children so what so how have I passed that spiritual legacy on? Have I passed that spiritual legacy on? Because, you know, as, as you consider when Joshua led the people across the Jordan River as a miracle and God said to Joshua, to the people, take 12 stones and build 12 stones as a memorial so that when your children ask in time to come, what do these means? You will not forget to tell them. Make sure you pass on that spiritual legacy to the next generation. And then it also says, and so that all the world may know. So you are to pass on that spiritual legacy and impact the world. So what has been the spiritual impact you've had on the world and the spiritual impact on your children? I mean, that's, that's really what I want people to see, you know, because I, I can look back and give testimony of the impact my parents had on me and standing on God's word. You know, I saw my, ma my father was like Nehemiah, you know, Nehemiah got angry. It was, it was a righteous anger. Why doesn't somebody do something about this? You know, we, we need to fix up the wall. Why doesn't somebody do something? You know, there's, there's a, these people doing something they shouldn't in the temple. Why doesn't somebody do something? My father was all, always like that. And so why just sit back and let these things happen around us? Shouldn't, shouldn't we be saying, what can we do to, to impact the world? What can we do to be an impact in our church? What can we do to be, be an imp, imp, impact for our children? Because it's only what done, what done for Jesus at last. See, I still hear my mother saying that in my head. I'll, I'll never forget that. And God first, others second, yourself last. Our parents drummed that into us. It's only what's got done for the Lord. And so that's what I want people to pick up from this is to say, Wow, what's, what's my testimony? You know, I could sum it up this way. When my father uh, passed away, uh, one of my good friends in Australia, um, when he came to the memorial service, uh, the kids got up and all in a different way, you know, there were six kids, but we all in a different way gave testimony to how our father taught us to stand on God's word and, and, and uh, to boldly stand and never knowingly compromise and so on. And we all gave testimony as to that impact on our lives. And, you know, afterwards, this man came up to me and he said, you know, you know what I was thinking as I was sitting there listening to all this? What are my kids going to say about me when I'm dead? And I thought, Okay, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So uh, if, if, if think, get, read this book and at the end close the chapter and say, what are my kids going to say about me when I'm dead? Um, I mean, what are they going to attest 
uh, in regard to what I did? And uh, I think that's a good question to ask. Well, I'm glad they didn't use that as the title. As a book guy, will they stand? <laughs> Probably a little bit more positive, uh, but definitely a, an important question to ask just right now if you're listening to or watching this interview or when you pick up your own copy of the book and finish reading it. Really wrestle with that. What is the legacy that you are leaving, not only for your children, but your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren? Uh, there's nothing more empowering than trying to figure out how you leave this multi-generational legacy and this, then just stepping into the journey that God has you on with your family You'll never regret the time that you invested in that. That's why God has given you these children, these grandchildren, these great-grandchildren someday uh, to steward and really lead in the ways of the Lord. Uh, Ken, for the people who'd like to connect with your ministry, find out more about all your books and resources, where are some of the places we can discover you on the web? Well, answersingenesis.org. So our name of our ministry is answersingenesis.org. Answersingenesis.org. And we have thousands of articles and, of course, our store there and all the resources and materials. And, you know, for the Ark Encounter and Creation Museum, they can just do a search, Ark Encounter Creation Museum, and uh, get on the website. So they're easy to find. You can link to them from answersandgenesis.org as well. But that's our mother website, mother of all <laughs> AIG websites is answersandgenesis.org. And uh, I, I can vouch for there is just tons and tons of content. You can spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours reading all the great articles, watching videos, all the great content there. Uh, if you haven't yet been to, the, been to the Ark Encounter or the Creation Museum, you are missing out. Uh, plan to take your family there. It's an experience that I think will really uh, dramatically shift their lives. There's so many great opportunities to have great conversations with your kids as you're viewing the different exhibits. It's just I, I was amazed at the discussions that were brought up. Uh, with my kids, not only while we were there, but as we were going home as well, as they just processed everything that they saw, everything that they experienced while they were there. And like we do with every episode, we'll have links to the show notes, places where you can connect with Answers in Genesis and pick up your very own copy of this new book as well. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbit Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Ken Ham. Once again, our book today was Will They Stand? Parenting Kids to Face the Giants. For more on Ken, his resources, his ministry, a great place to start is the Answers in Genesis website. You can find that over at AnswersInGenesis.org. And Ken, I just want to say thank you for sharing with us today. It's truly been an honor and a pleasure to finally have you on the show. Thank you, sir. Hey, thanks, Sean. Great to be with you.